Oh, hello, hello. Yo. You you appear to be in a really fancy recording studio. <laughs> yeah, well, I have choices. Okay, so I chose recording studio for you. It could have been, um, let's see, choose virtual background. I could have chosen my office for you today. Mm. I, I thought mm, that, that, that could be nice too. Um, I also have my, uh, if I want to be in a venue, so sometimes mm. uh, I feel like it's best done from from the setting of a venue but mm. are you in a closet i i am in a closet <laughs> and this this isn't a a fake backdrop this is a real bona fide closet if you uh, need a sweater if you need a shirt yeah there's even right here we have a, a hat that says uh, you stay classy for some yeah. reason yeah yeah that's nice <laughs> yeah e ev everything you might need in a in a closet yeah, uh, it, it makes sense. Okay, I think I'll go back to the office. I think that works for this one. You can be in the closet, I'll be in the office. Fair enough. Two rooms with poor ventilation. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have windows. I think I have windows over there somewhere. Looks okay. like a little, it's lit from that side. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Uh, so, hi. Hello. Stephen. Yeah, so name of the podcast is How Did I Get Here? Uh, which is a ripoff of a Talking Heads song as anybody that's listening to this podcast would have immediately figured out. Uh, but yeah, so what, what I'm doing is I'm taking people through their career journey, folks that have done something in the music business that isn't necessarily performer or, you know, something that, that isn't somebody that you normally follow the career path of. Uh, and I realized mm -hmm. I know very little about you or how Balanced Breakfast came to be, or yeah. what got you here. Uh, so my, my, f my first question for you is, what was the show, not your first show, but the show that made you decide music is how I want to spend my life? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, truthfully, I don't think it was like a traditional show. I think it was more of a fa a family thing because music was in my family, but uh, not not in a traditional sense of like oh there's a band and oh the family plays these shows or th or this or that. It was more like uh, my grandpa could pick up any instrument and after strumming it a few times or after hitting a few of the keys, he'd understand the sound of it and he could play just about any song, which was amazing to watch. So he. He liked to play the mandolin, and he, he could, uh, in about 10 to 15 minutes, figure out most songs on the mandolin. Um, and then various members were part of, like, the church choir, and and so it just felt like this is really cool, seeing them excel at their at their craft and just be really good at it. Um, and so I think that's the earliest, uh, like, memory I have of music. Mm -hmm. And then, and then slowly, like, all right, digging into mom's record collection or being in the car with dad and listening to what he thought was cool and trending. Um, uh, yeah, so it was like, it was not like the traditional story of, of like, oh, my parents took me to this like 80s concert that was so cool. Like, I kind of wish it was, but it's not. Uh, is there like a song or a record that the the whole family kind of bonded over? Um, no. So my family is uh, very religious, and and so I feel like ninety percent of the time we were in the car, we were listening to like uh, Christian music. So there's this uh, this um, I think it's called Salty, and like the big blue book or something it's like it's like it's like the singing song book that would sing all these kids books kids songs um and we, we listened to that on the way to swimming lessons we listened to that like going across town going grocery shopping um but uh the the thing okay so uh the thing my family makes fun of me though is uh is you know like when you pick like your first memorable uh cd or record or something that you bought with your own money um we we lived uh we didn't live near any record stores or cd stores or places to buy music but in the 90s mcdonald's was doing this thing where uh, if you bought a 
think if you bought a hamburger or if you bought something, you could also buy a CD for $5. And so at the time they had like Garth Brooks and, and two other artists that I didn't know and Tina Turner. And I was like, the cover of the Tina Turner best, best of was like so sexy that I was just like, it's that. And so I listened to like, what's love got to do with it almost every single night. Um, so that's, that's like the most rock and roll thing for a what, 13 year old or something. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I'm guessing that was the Tina Turner, simply the best compilation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, th that's got, got some good stuff on it. So uh, that, for sure, that makes sense as to why that was your like secular music jumping point. But I didn't know it at the, at the, at that, at that point, I didn't know how good it was going to be. Um, yeah, I didn't know it was going to be that. I didn't know it was going to be that good. I think my follow-up one, uh, I'm getting better here, was like Aerosmith, um, uh, big ones. So I'm, 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 I got right around like teenage years, I was getting better. Yeah, although I, I would argue that Tina Turner is better than Aerosmith. I, I, um, I mean, definitely different. Mm -hmm. Definitely, uh, um, probably has yeah withstand, withstood the test of time. Um, but that Big Ones album is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the Big Ones, does that go all the way back to the 70s? Like, does it have things like As, Dr Dream On and like... Uh, the the oh. main one I think of is like Jane, Jane's Got a Gun. Um, well, you're, you're, you're pressing my knowledge here. Let's see. <laughs> let's see. I'm not certain um, uh, what what was on that. Let's see. Um, walk on water, love in an elevator, ragdoll, what it takes, dude. Uh, Janie's got a gun, crying, amazing, blind man, deuces are wild, the other side, crazy, eat the rich, angel, living on the edge. All right. So it was 80s, 90s, Aerosmith. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so this is where you sort of found it for fun. Uh, I did a yeah. little LinkedIn uh, investigating to, yeah. to see what your resume actually looks like. Uh, you, so you went to school for graphic design. Yeah, that's but correct. It look, but it looks like you found yourself doing graphic design for a lot of different music apps and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, was that was that strategic? Was it just kind of magic that you ended up like working for companies like uh, Magnify in Music City? Like, yeah. How how did you end up? landing landing these gigs 100 percent strategic the the idea is like okay um i guess growing up i tried to learn an instrument so i thought oh my i want to be i want to be i want to be in the band i want to i want to, to like get on stage and and rock out and just like get all sweaty and and do the the typical tour and get rowdy and uh discovered i i, I couldn't play drums I couldn't uh, play clarinet. Singing was not an option. Piano, I was horrible at. Like every single thing I tried, I was just like, it's not working. Um, and so it was like, as I got older, I was like, I gotta figure out a way in. There's gotta be something other than creating music. And so, yeah, it was like the goal to figure out how to use design in the music industry. So always yeah. the goal. Yeah, so which you've done well at, so that takes us to balance breakfast sort of like a bunch of a bunch of fa failed attempts at other things and then balance breakfast but yeah <laughs> okay let's let's talk about talk about the failures what what is it that you were trying to to do before you hit uh, hit balance breakfast like what what were some of those yeah. projects um, so my, my thesis project was to write a survival guide for bands about how to better market and promote yourself. Um, and so I collected a bunch of advice from other musicians who I thought were doing well. And in theory, that's a great idea. A survival guide that tells you exactly how to navigate the music industry. Mm. Uh, in the problem comes in the fact that if you try to print that, it's outdated in six months to a year. It's like, all this great information and then you go okay well next year none of that matters because it's mm. it's like that that let's say we wrote it in the year of of magnify well well what about the year that they stopped existing um mm. so um or like 
for example, it was written in the time period of MySpace. And so everything that's written about that doesn't matter anymore. Um, mm. So that, that was a cool idea. Didn't work. Um, so that was my project. I called that, um, uh, it was like a mixture between a survival guide and writing about, writing about the San Francisco music scene. Um, it was called SF Intercom. And the other poem it had is like, the music industry is bigger than just San Francisco. So calling something SF Intercom only allows it to be as big as the city you're in. So doomed, doomed to, uh, to hit that glass wall ceiling situation and go, well, how do we get bigger? Well, it's hard. Yeah, well, yeah. It's first, the, the original name for Spinning Platters was uh, South by SF, which we realized mm. really, really boxed you in hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I totally get that. Uh, all right. So, so, uh, so what was SF Intercom exactly though? Like it was, was it, a, it was a, just a, a blog of sorts or? Yeah, it was, it was a project that was basically just me reaching out to as many people as I could and collecting together information. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I tried to take that and branch it out into a radio show and that's fun and cool, but it, it's actually really, for, for me, it was really, really um, hard to get excited about these imaginary people out there that were listening. Like someone's listening, but you can't see them. You can't touch them. You just know that they're out there somewhere in the, in the ether. And you're like looking at your stats and going, all right, uh, the numbers look okay. But it got, it got kind of lonely sitting in the studio, right. like trying to do a show and, 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 uh, not interacting with people. So it was like, that was cool for about three years. And then it was like, this is, this is hard. Um, yeah, it's kind of, I mean, it's similar to podcasting, but I guess you're choosing your own time frame and schedule for what, when you do it. So maybe if you're not in the mood, you can switch to another day. Yeah. And yeah. And podcasting it, it's, it's, it's interactive if you make sure it's interactive. Yeah. True. Yeah. Like yeah. I, yeah. I, I've, considered doing a solo podcast and it just just didn't didn't fly yeah like I would, yeah i would speak so slowly when i wasn't talking to somebody it was painful <laughs> just editing uh okay so so intercom got lonely essentially yeah. uh and was balanced breakfast what was next no i tried to i tried to make it not lonely by doing a thing called i Heart sf bands mm -hmm. and uh and it was fun. And a lot of people that are now in breakfast wrote for I Heart SF bands and it was social and fun and, and filled that void. But um, again, was still boxed in by the fact that like, like someone would ask me like, can I write about a band that's not San Francisco? And I was like, well, kind of, sort of. I mean, are they playing here soon? Um, so it was cool for a while. And, and then, yeah, and then it just was like, all right, like, like what what can we write about the whole scene can we write, can we inc be more inclusive so i mean i i love other cities <laughs> uh so so then balance breakfast then balance breakfast <laughs> i was gonna uh, let you i was gonna let you set that up and be like now <laughs> yeah which first of all you're dealing with a, a community that that largely works too late for breakfast yeah but yeah. nonetheless, uh, so balanced breakfast. This, if I if I understand correctly, started out as uh, just meeting up with people for breakfast, like at, at way too early in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. Well, way too early in the morning was ten a.m. Eight a.m. Eight a.m. Dear we God, we started eight, at eight a.m. on Thursdays. Do you even understand how musicians work? No, kidding, kidding, kidding. I know, you would think not. You're like, I understand. I understand now why you've been so, like, uh, struggling to find something successful. <laughs> uh, so w when you had your first meeting of Balanced Breakfast, yeah. uh, who did you invite? Who was, who was there? Like, what, or not necessarily people, but what different yeah. types of people in music did you have? Well, it was it was me and Andy Freeman at first because we had previously had a meeting and talked about the music industry and talked about all the things we could possibly launch together and had these 
a lot of like brick and mortar ideas of things that in my mind had failed all of the years previous, like, uh, like uh, management companies and things, things that, that, that hadn't proven themselves. So balance breakfast came out of the idea of like, we had fun talking to each other and like imagining what we could have done together that we decided to just invite our friends and be like, Hey, you want to come have breakfast and talk about the music industry and just like kind of explore ideas. So the, that, that first meeting I think had five or six people and it was just like friends of mine, friends of Andy's. And it only took like three or four meetings to suddenly outgrow a, a, a typical dining room table, like a, a, like a diner table, if you will, like, suddenly we have nine or 10 people and we're trying to pull chairs from all across <laughs> the cafe. Um, so we had to switch from a small cafe named Jim's to a bigger um, place called Crepe House that had m more open seating. But uh, after about um, a year, we were drawing in 50 people to breakfast at 8 a.m., which was just crazy town. Um, yeah, on, on a weekday. On a weekday at 8 a.m. <laughs> it was weird uh yeah it was weird so then it ne it didn't have a name yet so it needed a name so it kind of like c came out of the group that's uh, like on one particular breakfast people were just popcorning names and balanced breakfast popped out and people were like yeah that's cool um and it, and it and i will say it has always been successful because it's not just me. It's a bunch of other people that are invested in it and are like, this is so cool. Like this needs to be bigger. This needs to be in more cities. Um, whereas my brainchild was like, it's going to be five people having breakfast in a diner. Um, so uh, if not for really passionate people, like it would have been, it would have been just that just a handful of friends talking about music and sitting at a table. Yeah. So five people's, easy to have a conversation with. Yeah. Uh, what did you have to do to organize 50 people to make sure uh -huh. <laughs> folks weren't left out? Like, yeah. basically you, you start, I'm assuming you had to have an agenda at that point. Um, yeah. What was that? What was that process? We had to, yeah, we had to get organized. Um, it, it is hard because we were having like, like, like your typical I guess if you, it's funny because people kept starting to compare it to like AA because you'd say, hi, my name is, this is my first time at a meeting. And you're like, welcome. Uh, <laughs> so it, it very much kind of became like AA for musicians, but, but having like a music problem. Um, but we would like, when we got to the point that like one circle wasn't enough, it's like we're going from one side of the cafe to the other as one circle. We say, okay, cool do we start a second circle around the, uh, that circle? <laughs> so we started having like tiers of circles. Um, and then we started messing around with shapes like, okay, maybe one circle is not right. Do we do like this pretzeling shape or? Um, <laughs> it, yeah, it was pure chaos. <laughs> it was amazing, but it was pure chaos. So yeah. if you're thinking, how do you organize uh, 50 people in a, in a diner? I'm like, yes, yes. How, yeah. how, do you, how do you do that? Now, now, did you ever just use a treble clef? <laughs> that is a shape. Oh, I think uh, if we had it, if we had drones at that time, we might have been able to fly over the top of it and have some interesting shape. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Good, good yeah. point. I, I, I neglected to realize that that this is. Yeah, actually, what year is this? That of the the first Did, bounce breakfast meeting. Oh, I thought you were saying right now, and I say I think it's August twenty fifth of twenty twenty. But my, I'm all off right now on my calendar. This pandemic thing is messing me up. <laughs> um but balanced breakfast <laughs> yes <laughs> okay uh november of 2013 so yeah. s seven years ago and yeah. how long did it take to get from that five to 50 mm, maybe maybe w one year yeah that's, probably one year th that's some Im impressive growth it really uh, was yeah, yeah. so so in that that first year, that was 2013. So that was also kind of a significant year in terms of how you sold music too, because that would have been kind of the move from MP3 to streaming was 
mm -hmm. hitting that year. Uh, that would have been kind of maybe just before SoundCloud and Bandcamp really took off. Yeah. Uh, well, it was. I was going to say what it really was was when all of the voices of San Francisco were saying that San Francisco was dead. It's like all everybody in San Francisco was either moving away or was saying like the music scene in San Francisco is dead, and we're all sitting here going, "How is that? We're still here and trying to do cool things." Like. It can't be dead yet. Um, it might be, might be a little more dead now. Well, obviously, but a little bit. Yeah, nonetheless. Uh, so, what, what? Do you remember any like crazy great ideas during that year? Because that is a very pivotal year. That was like kind of a year of flux. That was a year where m people didn't quite know where to market their music. Yeah. Yeah, like well, I think what I think what people were excited about is that with breakfast people were no longer um holding on to their ideas as being precious. So it was like you no longer had the keys to the kingdom based on knowing uh something about the music industry that no one else knew. It was like everybody is like saying, "Okay, hey, I I am I am trying to put my music out there. Should I should I go with um uh ASCAP or BMI? Should I like, how should I distribute my music? What, like, what platform should I use? And everybody's just talking about it, being like, hey, this is why you should go ASCAP, or this is why you should go BMI. This is this is the, the best distribution right now. And it's like, you're just going to tell me that? Cool. I'll come back next week. Yeah, so. well, it's great about being in a time of flex is everyone's kind of generous with the information that they have. Yeah. But, I mean, when when I first started like trying to do music professionally in about 2009 ish i felt like everybody was like oh i i i can't, i know the answer but i can't tell you because you need to go find out on your own you can find it though it's on the internet do a little research and it's like seriously you just just tell me let's talk let's have coffee it's like yeah. leverage yeah although the secret was in 2009 <laughs> those people didn't really know <laughs> Cause yeah, yeah, perhaps and, that yeah, yeah. Like two thousand nine was kind of the the beginning of the end of the CD, and before yeah. anyone was expecting the vinyl resurgence to happen, like the, that was the year people were going heavy on iTunes. Yeah, because iTunes but it was yeah, it, but yeah, it was. But everybody was like, I don't know. It just sort of, it just sort of felt like an unfriendly music scene, mm. and. Uh, and it was like, and it was like, I want in, but why is everybody so mean? Um, yeah, because everyone was so, scared. <laughs> yeah, and also we had to, that was one of the things in the early balance breakfast. We had to make rules. You're not allowed to talk about how good the music scene used to be. That was like our main rule. Is like we can talk about everything, but we can't spend an hour talking about how great it used to be because who wants to talk about that? Not I mean, not me. Not me. So, yeah, well, I mean, nostalgia, nostalgia for a time past. In that situation, only kind of leaves you feeling more distraught. Like you're, you're not gonna, if you're, you're looking towards the past and just getting that back, just trying to get that back, then you don't make any movement. Yeah, yeah. So, so speaking of movement, so 20, 2013 is when you began. Yeah. Um, you, you, you kept growing. When did you have your first satellite balance breakfast meeting? Let's see. So I know where it was. The first one was in Oakland and um, Brian from a band called Mr. Kind was having, was basically saying like, I'm coming all the way from Oakland. I, uh, it's, it's actually a little hard to get here at 8 a.m. Uh, from Oakland. What if, what if I were to start one in a balanced breakfast over there? And at the time that just, it's like, it's not that wild of an idea, but it blew my mind. I was like, <laughs> I mean, I, I, anybody can host breakfast. So what are we doing that's making this so unique that you want to do like a franchise of it? So, so I laughed at first and then I said, awesome. Yes. Give me some time to make some documents that clarify, like, you know, if Bikram has like set, how many like yoga moves that makes brick, Bikram, like then breakfast needs to have these steps that makes it breakfast. And let me go write those down. So, so that you could do my version of back breakfast, if you will. Um, so uh, let's see, I think, 
that had to have been a, a, like somewhere in the area of a year and a half or two years. And then it quickly went to San Jose uh, with uh, Barb from Barb Rocks. And uh, then um, Angela from Muddy Paw wanted to take it with her when she moved to Toronto. And then it just started popping up and people were like, I know this person in Denver. I know this person in Austin. And everybody's like, I can do it in my city. And, um, and, and I'd say 50% of them were real. Like 50% of people were like, yeah, actually I'm going to do this. And other ones were just excited. And I, and I just kind of like kept my finger on it and be like, you really, you really, really going to do it? Really? Just like, <laughs> maybe we just become friends, but maybe you do start a breakfast in your city. So yeah, it, it definitely had, quite a few years of like me just trying to hold on and be like, I've got, I'm with you. Don't worry. I'm not letting go. And, and then I, I would say like the last year or two, it's been a process of like, okay, cool. It, it exists. A certain amount of people know about it and how do we keep that momentum going? So um, that's been, that's been fun figuring out how to be like, all right, well, well, what can we be besides breakfast? What, what other things can we do? Mm-hmm. Once you went in international, even your it yeah. sounded like like it sounded like you went to Toronto before you left the Bay Area, practically. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> um, so balanced breakfast at, at this point, like it's several different communities. Um, yeah. It's it's also a blog. I mean, it's it's a, a lot of different things, uh, and at yeah. some point you you decided to go full-on conference yeah <laughs> uh, all right so 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 2017 your 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 first summit yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. How, how did you create a summit like like th- that's definitely at something more than one meeting like yeah was this you all by your lonesome coming up with panels like what what was your process to create a bona fide music conference yeah it okay so it was a few parts it was going to lots of other people's conferences and and being like, this is really cool. And realizing that most of them aren't designed for musicians. Most of them are designed for um, music business. So what they talk about is technology, like releasing apps, just the business behind it, investing and all that kind of stuff. And so one particular one, um, dare I say one of my more favorite ones, but it was... Um, SF music tech. I asked Brian, I said, I said, this is great. Like the, all the panels are really um, highbrow. I enjoy them, but none of the information is geared towards artists. Like this, we're not talking about things that, that an artist can, can take in and then the next day go put into action. And he said, yeah, that's because this conference isn't designed for musicians says if but you should create something that is and i was like laughed at him because i was like i don't have the resources for that um but flash forward four years and like doing breakfast for 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 about that long as well uh started to realize that that meeting for breakfast sort of sort of sort of had this like graduation phase where you, where you come to breakfast you come to breakfast you come to breakfast and you you've you've taken in all this information and now you're so busy like doing it like touring and playing shows and and deep into the industry that it's like oh it's really really hard to get to breakfast so that group needed the next thing so that was the the goal was to make that next thing the summit so that like once a year everybody who was like oh man I'm so busy could either come back and join or come back and speak at the summit. Um, and yeah, it's hard. It's very hard, uh, but it's fun. Um, but yeah, it's hard. And it's a little bit of just like too much coffee. And it's like, oh, I've got these ideas. And and then a little bit of like, just putting a lot of faith on the people that lead the panels and just be like, I'm not gonna helicopter this. Like, a, like I'm not gonna be hovering over to make sure it's going well. It's like, it's yours. And, and I'm going to just, enjoy the day and make sure things are flowing smoothly and um that's a lot of trust yeah yeah well you you can't be in five rooms at once nope actually how many how many rooms did you have going at once that first year uh uh so i i i don't know how to come in softly or like to like not um 
like the idea of like having um, one panel at a time never crossed my mind. So we had three panels at a time uh, for the whole day and that just seemed right. Uh, so uh, yeah, it was, I think 50 or 60 different speakers and yeah, and three panels an hour and yeah, it was pure chaos for about six hours or seven hours. Well, technically the whole day, but like the actual panels go for a certain number of hours and then hangout time. Assume that you're exhausted at the end of all of it and just running on fumes. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, the the when it comes to my panel, which is always the last panel, I always try to have shots of something on the table for, for me and the, <laughs> the whoever's on my panel because it's like the whole day I've wanted a shot because I'm like, this is crazy. And then finally when it becomes my panel, I go, I don't have any more responsibilities after this. Like, shot please. <laughs> yeah. So so what do you do if one of your uh headlining panelists uh, isn't drinking? I mean like Aaron Axelson? Yes, For exactly example. like Aaron Axelson. Yes, someone that uh, was was definitely part of all of this uh last year. Yep. Uh, so I got lucky. I went and bought alcohol and then I came back and someone goes, "You do know Aaron doesn't drink, right?" And I was like, interesting nope uh and so that's when i leaned on piano fight the the venue we were at and said hey uh last minute but can you make me a non-alcoholic foofy drink with lots of things coming out of it uh cool thanks <laughs> uh so so everyone got shots and aaron axelson got something delicious perhaps for, for those of you that that um don't find whiskey delicious yes indeed uh so also going back to last year's you m may have been the last conference of 2020 Ooh, interesting how, yeah how does how does that feel <laughs> like you you pulled it off and it ended like and literally yeah, like that's it was, true huh it, it was balanced breakfast then noise pop happened and then yeah the entire country stopped yeah <laughs> does how did that feel like finding out what like if this thing was just a week later or yeah you know, oh man that would have hurt so bad because i because I, I was in route to south by southwest when the world, world shut down mm -hmm. and so i think about how much it hurt to cancel all the bands that i had scheduled for south by southwest like that was that was that was painful based on how many hours of time was invested into it. Um, and I lost some money, but yeah, if a summit where, where a lot of money investments are made in advance hadn't happened, that would have hurt in a lot more ways than, 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 than South by did. Um, but yeah, I hadn't really thought of, I guess, I guess uh, I, I, have been too busy thinking about all the things that haven't happened to think about the things that successfully did happen before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So um, you are hundred percent right that how cool is that? But at the same time, I'm like, <laughs> what about South by and what about trips I had planned and what about festivals that I was going to go to? And what about the, the biggest year of the, uh, that I was planning for, like, like for work and financially. And nope. Yeah, but Out the still, window. You did. You did really well, and you, I, I mean, I don't know what your attendance numbers were, but I do remember during the panel that I was part of, like, yelling at people to move over so other folks yeah. can actually get in. That's perfect. Uh, yeah, and still, like, little old me was in a, speaking in a room that was beyond capacity, so you also lucked out that n nobody was infected at this thing. Yeah, I well, I don't even think it was a concept at the time. This is so early in February that like I don't even think uh it, I mean sure surely some some people in some country or some place probably had it, but it wasn't even a conversation yet in February in San Francisco. I I wasn't even aware of that. I wasn't I didn't even know anything about it at that time. Um, yeah, yeah, working at Eventbrite we we started talking about it. There was definitely like the we know about this thing happening in China. What happens when when this comes to the U.S.? If it comes to the U.S., how does it affect things? Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, it was it took so little time. Yeah. Uh, so so at this point, I've been asking people kind of how they're they're pivoting to keep afloat during COVID. 
I'm going to ask you a little bit different question. It's okay. how are you helping people pivot during this time? Yeah, that's fun. So yeah, so um, Balance Breakfast um, is is on the on the okay. So you know how you have those labors of love, and then you have those labors of love that can financially support you. Mm. Um, I'd say Balance Breakfast is is like like on the edge of something so it's like maybe pretty soon it could be financially viable to just do breakfast but it's not yet so i have to do um marketing and have to get i get to do marketing and design within the music industry and a lot of my clients are from balance breakfast so that's pretty awesome um it's like one of those things we talk about in breakfast is like everybody's like how do i how do i um make all this like networking and all the things I'm doing make money. And I always tell them, it's like, it's not going to be what you expect. It's going to come in from the side and you're going to be like, I never thought that money was going to come from here. I was expecting it to come like through normal funnels, but all of a sudden you're surviving based on these other things. So that's kind of my story. But um, yeah, like I guess I have been helping a few bands with their marketing plans, with their social media agendas, with what they've been trying to put out there with the idea that if you're releasing music, you can't have your traditional um, EP release show as if like, let's go to bottom of the hill and have a show. It's not going to happen. Um, so figuring out, okay, well, do we do some sort of free online show or do we hang out on Zoom or um, trying to figure out everything and just trying to figure out, okay, well, why would anybody want to blog about you? Like, do you have a story that's interesting and trying to create those stories so that someone's like, I really want to talk about you. Um, so it's been, it's been fun. Uh, it's different. Um, I think, I think, I think also like in March, everybody was freaking out and pulling their money as close to them as they could and being like, no, my precious. And now we're, we're getting to the point where people are like, I think I'll start considering releasing that thing I recorded in January now. Mm -hmm. And so people are starting to spend money again. Mm -hmm. So it's good. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, the way I've been, not to ramble, but how about I ramble for a second? The <laughs> way, the way I've been describing it is that like in, in January, I might've bragged that all of my clients were in the entertainment realm. And I was like, yes, I'm doing hundred percent entertainment. Yes. That's the goal. Everybody wants to like, be in the field that they're most passionate about. And then the pandemic happens and entertainment is not considered um, nece a necessity. And so all your clients disappear and you're like, shoot, I wish I had some clients outside of entertainment. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing now is like, how about diversification? Yeah, so, I, so, that's my recommendation. Uh, that, yeah, that, that is, uh, it's funny because I was thinking to myself like, uh, I was really proud of the fact that every job I've had has been music related up until this point. And now that I'm looking for work, my resume really doesn't fit anything specifically out there. And I'm like, yeah, this is it's about right. <laughs> yeah. I really, really shouldn't have, have, <laughs> have gone all in on this, but let, let's, the let's look forward. Cause this is all going to come back. Yeah. Like, yeah. What's your bet? For, okay. So, so not to ask you a question from, from my podcast, but I'm going to ask you a question from my podcast. <laughs> um, if you were going to make a bet on when venues like bottom of the hill, we're going to have what could be described as a, as a normal bottom of the hill show. Maybe it's masks, but you could have like full capacity. What's um, what's the date. So based on what, I, what I'm reading, like, what epidemiologists are saying, all the things I've con I'm consuming, mm -hmm. uh, I I predict that we'll be able to have maskless open drinking indoor shows by fall of 2021. Oh, not bad, not bad. I think we're gonna have outdoor festival kind of things before that. Yeah, you're saying like September October of 2021. Yeah, I think I think that's okay. when I, I feel like things are going to be like all together, like comfortable and ready to go. And it's going to be a, a combination of us getting serious about masking and social distancing in the meantime. I like your answer. My my answer's sooner, but with masks. So I was figuring like 
February 1st, we could maybe have semi-normal indoor shows with masks, but, um, but I might be being a little optimistic. Yeah, I mean, that would be, would be fantastic about that is uh, that means noise pop never takes a year off. That would be amazing. Yeah, because th- th- those are my two thoughts are like Sketchfest and Noise Pop both yeah. made it and made it pretty cleanly. Will will Sketchfest and Noise Pop happen next year? Which Ooh. I so our summit usually happens in February, and I I definitely haven't started planning it yet because it seems irresponsible to be thinking about uh, planning anything that's supposed to happen in person now while we're while we're not allowed to have those. So what about what about spinning platters? Like, have you been focusing on it more now when you have more time, or uh, same amount, same old, same old? I spent like two whole months posting nothing, mm. but that was what I what I call the somber period, panic mode. Yeah, and then uh, one day I was humming to myself the song Get Better by Mates of State. Nice. And with the, that chorus, things are going to get lighter even if they don't get better. Mm, nice. And I thought, holy shit. <laughs> that's, that's, what I, that's where I need to get to. Because I was, kept thinking, like, this is never going to end. This is never going to end. And the question is, not when is this going to end the question is how do we manage this how do we like how does the we get the weight off so my first post was uh after months was just that song with the lyrics and that kind of kick-started me to get working again and things have looked bleak before and (laughs) yeah things will, will become less bleak in the future yeah, a friend, a friend hit me up and he's like, how, how are you not depressed? And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, man, your Instagram is blowing up. Like you're doing all this fun stuff. And I go, I go dude, 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 there's a difference between real life and Instagram. You need to remember <laughs> that Instagram is the glorified version of what your life actually is. It's only the good stuff. You don't, you don't need to post. You get to choose what you post. So I said, don't worry. I am depressed. And he goes, Oh, thank God. That makes me feel so much better. And I was like, that's kind of dark, but okay. Fair. (laughs) As long as Stefan's depressed, it's all right for me to be depressed. You've given a, you've given everyone the okay there. Yeah. (laughs) But no, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put, I feel like I'm called to entertain. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to use social media as my outlet for, for feeling down. It's like that. That's in person. If I if I've got people I want to talk to or phone calls I need to make, I'm gonna be like, I'm having a really bad day. But it doesn't need to be on social media. Um, but that's my personal choice. Uh, but yeah, like, so he's like, I was like, he's like, that's oh, that's right, that's right. Instagram's not fully real. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> and imagine if somebody's real life was their Instagram feed. I would be making these magnificent meals every single day and going on scooter rides to get donuts like uh, every afternoon. It would be amazing. No, donuts every afternoon could lead to some other other very, very tangible problems that I don't want to consider. Yeah. Well, also I'd be going to the gym every single day because probably I could post some picture that suggested I was at the gym. That's true. That, that balances <laughs> out the, the, the donuts. Yeah. Yeah, if it doesn't yeah. have to be real, I'm posting three times a day. I'm like, gym photo, donut photo. I <laughs> cook this amazing dinner every single day. Yeah. I need more donuts. Yeah. I I can't I can't get you donuts right now. But nonetheless. Uh we should we should probably wrap this up. This has been a lot of fun. I I've had fun too. Uh, it's been nice hanging out in your closet. Yeah, thank you. It's, it wasn't too stuffy in here. Not too bad. I um I'm, I see some outfits I might like to borrow though. So that 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 cream um sweater there looks nice, and that jacket and uh, the acoustics are amazing in here too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I should finally finally record a demo in in this closet as well. Nice. Can I yeah. um can I name drop my social media uh, links? You can name drop all of those. Name drop. Uh, my social media is Stefan Aronson, uh, first name, last name. 
uh, Stefan with an F. And then Balanced Breakfast is Balanced Breakfast with no vowels. And we're on all the platforms. This has been fun. Excellent. Well, also, if you just Google Stefan Balanced Breakfast. That's true. <laughs> That's some, some crazy photos of me at a show going, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> yeah, which is clearly you in front of a green screen there, too. Yeah, <laughs> on the internet, too. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Th th this has been a blast. Thank you for, for, for coming on and telling us about you and being the first guest to ask me questions. Well, I, 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 I would have asked more. If we, um, well, how much time do we have left? This has been, been pretty good. You didn't talk about doing anything illegal that I need to, to cut out. Uh, no industry secrets there that need to be yeah. removed. Nope. I, um, um, I have a rule that um, anybody who's on my podcast or if I'm on anybody else's podcast, I only say the things I'd want my mom to hear. So if she listens to this podcast, I don't want her to be like, my son is doing what? She already knows that I've got too much energy and I run around at shows going, oh my gosh, it's good to see you. Oh, so happy you're here. So nothing, nothing leaked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it also, if, if, you're, if your darkest quality is you're energetic and love people. <laughs> Well, during a pandemic is not allowed. Oh, no. Yes, no, that, that's pretty that shady true. right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, on that note, I can't wait till we can hug again. Well, we can, we can have virtual hugs at Balanced Breakfast every other Thursday. You can join us there. I'll, I'll give you a, a screen high five. Excellent. Wow. You actually disappeared with that high five. It was great. <laughs> you put up your hand and I could just see your office. You're, su you're suggesting that, um, that uh, my high five was not designed for podcasts? I, yes, that is true. I am definitely suggesting that high fiving does not make for good podcast material. So I should have said high five. This has been a great show. <laughs> That's really where I'm going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on, on that note, now I, I must get going.